Opposition says, if we've uh, got time, safe... Thank you, um, Senator Sheldon, and I believe um, Senator Farrell is seeking the call. Senator Farrell. Uh, thank you, President. I wish to advise the Chamber of changes to ministerial arrangements for today. Senator Wong is absent from question time on account of ministerial business overseas. In her absence, I will represent the Prime Minister, the Minister for Foreign Affairs, the Minister for International Development and the Pacific, the Minister for Defence, the Minister for Veterans Affairs, the Minister for Defence Personnel and the Minister for Defence Industry. Um, <laughs> um, oh, that'll happen. That'll happen. Uh, Senator Gallagher will represent the Minister for Climate Change and Energy and the Minister for Environment and Water. Thank you, President. Thank you, Senator Farrell. Uh, I'm calling... Oh, I thought I was calling Senator Reynolds, but I'm not. I'm calling Senator Rustin. Thank you. Um, thank you, um, President. Uh, my question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, uh, Senator Farrell. Um, I refer the Minister to the announced cessation of Operation COVID Shield from the 1st of August. I asked the minister, could he detail the advice the government received that led you to remove this effective operation at a time when vaccinations remain at the primary defence to the pandemic? Thank you, Senator Rustin. Senator Farrell. Uh, thank you, um, uh, President, and thank the uh, <coughs> senator for her, uh, her question. Um, look, I think we start any debate about the issue of uh, COVID and uh, uh, what's uh, happened in the past uh, with an understanding of <coughs> what your government failed to do when you were in... Uh, in uh... Um, oh, yes, Senator Farrell, resume your seat. Uh, Senator Rustin. Mm, uh, on a point of order on relevance, um, uh, President, um, I would just ask you to draw the uh, minister's attention to the fact that I was actually asking very specifically about advice received mm -hmm. about the uh, cessation of Operation COVID Shield and nothing else. Thank you, uh, Senator Rustin. Um, the minister has just started his uh, answer. I'll um, pay particular attention uh, that he remains relevant to the question. Thank you. Continue, please, Minister. Thank you, uh, Madam uh, President. Um, as I uh, had started to uh, answer the, uh, the question, uh, um, President, um, any debate about what's happened uh, with, uh, with COVID-19 in this country has to start right back where this government, sorry, the, the opposition, which is, was the government at the time, uh, failed um, the people of Australia. Um, we saw it, first of all, with the issue of closing, closure of the, uh, the borders. The government was too slow uh, to close the borders uh, when Minister, the issue— Minister, please resume a seat. Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you, President. Um, look, with the greatest amount of respect, I would draw uh, on, on a point of order on relevance. I would draw to your attention um, that the minister is not being even remotely relevant to my question, uh, and uh, I would ask you if you could draw him uh, to the substance and only the substance of my question. Thank you, uh, Senator Reynolds. Um, I do believe the minister is being relevant. He is talking about the COVID pandemic, which um, he's entitled to do as part of his response to your question. Um, as you know, I can't um, direct him to answer the question, but I can be cognisant of relevance, which I am. Please continue, Minister. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, President. And uh, oh, I think it's Senator Rustin who, who asked the question. Um, the COVID shield will cease on the 1st of August um, 2022. And from this time, the, the functions of the National COVID Vaccine Task Force uh, will return to the arrangements within the Department of Health and uh, Aged Care. The uh, Coordinator General of the COVID Shield, General Fruin, who I had the uh, good fortune to uh, meet uh, last night um, and uh, congratulate on the role that he has uh, performed um, in, this, uh, in this area, uh, will return to his role as the Chief of Joint Capabilities in the Department of Defence. Now, the Australian Government has ensured that the National COVID-19 vaccination program is providing support for people in Australia uh, and uh, who need to um, remain, uh, maintain their protection. Uh, thank uh, you, Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Rustin, first supplementary. Thank you, President. Um, I would like to ask the minister, what are the current third and fourth dose rates in residential aged care and what is the lowest dose rate? 
Thank you. Senator Rustin, Minister. Uh, thank you, um, uh, President, and thank uh, the Minister for, uh, for her question. Um, I don't, uh, obviously, this is not my <coughs> normal area of uh, responsibility. Um, I know that um, the, uh, the country has continued to um, increase and improve the uh, level of um, um, vaccination um, in this area. And I'll be very happy to get those figures uh, for the uh, minister. In fact, I right now have the answer um, to those uh, questions. Thank uh, Senator Gallagher, um, who does represent the uh, Minister for, uh, for Health, uh, that very hardworking uh, Mr Butler. Over three quarters of residents estimated to be eligible for a fourth dose have received a four, fourth dose. dose up from around 50% in June 2022, uh, following efforts uh, by the, uh, uh, the government. Oh, thank you, Minister. Your time has expired, and I think uh, you undertook to take that on notice um, for the rest of the question, so I'd appreciate you taking yes, the rest I on did, notice. Yes, I did, and I will come back as quickly thank as you. I can. Second to supplementary, the, um, Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you very much, President, and uh, I'll look forward to clarification of the accuracy of the answer that was just given. Um, with fourth, fourth dose rates reported to be as low as one in five residents in aged care, how is the government going to ensure the safety of older Australians without the support of Operation COVID Shield? Thank you, Senator Rustin. Minister. Uh, thank you, uh, President, and thank the uh, Senator for, uh, for her question. Um, look, I mean, it's incredible that a government that yeah. so failed Australians on the issue of vaccination is now is now raising issues, raising issues about how we how uh, we are rolling out the uh, the vaccination program. Um, you failed to close the borders when you should have. You failed to order enough vaccinations. I know you. Um, Shaking your uh, head, Minister, Senator Birmingham, but that's Minister, the absolute please truth. Your seat. Senator Rustin. Thank you, President. Um, on a point of order on, on a matter of relevance, um, I was specific uh, um, order. was specifically asking in relation to uh, the current wave of COVID and aged care facilities and how the government intends to ensure that residents are vaccinated. Thank you, uh, Senator Rustin. I will remind the Minister of the question and call the Minister again. Thank you, President. Um, Look, this opposition still doesn't understand why you lost the last election. You lost the last election because um, you failed Minister, the people of Australia Minister, on— Please resume your seat. Sorry. Senator Rustin. Yeah. Um, thank you very much, President. I would draw um, to your attention that I believe that the minister is being wholly, completely and utterly irrelevant to the question, not just being not relevant, thank you. and I would ask you to draw thank his you, attention Senator to Rustin. the question. Um, the minister's got 15 seconds uh, to go. Minister. Thank you, President. Um, at every stage of this vaccination process, the, uh, the opposition, which was then the government, was simply too slow. Uh, Minister Farrell, please resume your seat. Uh, Senator Birmingham. Pre President, on the question of direct relevance, mm -hmm. you do have within your power the ability to draw the minister to the question. The question was precisely about what this government's plans are. The minister has spent the entirety um, of the answer you, talking Senator about Birmingham. previous you government. Will, please resume your seat. You will note that I did draw the minister to the question. Um, uh, I'm not asking you to debate. I did draw the minister back to the question, not the last time Senator Rustin stood up, but the time before that. I directly drew the minister back to the question. Minister, please continue. Question uh, directly. Yeah. <clears throat> but look, you have to understand. Thank the... you, Minister. Your time has expired. <laughs> Senator Walsh. Uh, my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Climate Change and Energy, Senator Gallagher. How is the Albanese government helping to put the climate wars behind us after a decade of climate denial and inaction? Minister Gallagher. Thank you. Thank you, President, and I um, thank Senator Walsh. Uh, for the excellent question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the Albanese government's climate change bill is a move to end the climate wars, to say goodbye and good riddance to the Bye. nine years of delay, Bye. dysfunction, denial 
denigration from the previous government. The fact is that Australia just didn't stand still under the former government. We went backwards. Our reputation on the international stage uh, and investment and confidence was stifled. The, the legislation that's passed the House is good for jobs, for power bills, for the economy and for our future. The climate change bill um, that we have introduced and passed and will come to the Senate legislates both a 2050 net zero target and the 2030 43 per cent emissions reductions target, tasks the Climate Change Authority to assess progress against these targets and advise the government on future targets, requires the Minister for Climate Change to report annually to Parliament on progress in meeting our targets and makes the targets relevant to key agencies like the Clean Energy Finance Corporation and Export Finance Australia. The Albanese government's climate change bill is an opportunity, an opportunity to vote on the side of progress, to vote for our children's future, to vote for a stronger economy. The government knows this, the business community knows this, and Australians know this. The only people who continue to fail well, I'm not Senator sure what Thorpe. Senator Thorpe is screaming at me for. Senator Thorpe, I mean, order. the last I heard, you were agreeing with this um, bill. Um, I know Minister, responding to interjections, um, but if you have someone yelling at you from down there, it is very Minister, hard to I'm ignore it. I'm calling a point of order. You Please resume order your seat. Order. Senator Thorpe, you are being disorderly, and I would ask you to show the respect deserved to the minister as she answers the question. Minister, please continue. Thank you, President. Uh, the business community knows it um, and the Australian people know it. The only people who continue to fail to understand it are those opposite. Passage of the legislation will mean this parliament collectively draws a line in the sand, saying enough is enough, and our legislation is Thank sensible you, and Your achievable. Time has expired. Senator Walsh, first supplementary. What will policy certainty mean for Australian businesses? Minister. Thank you, President. And this is an important question uh, about why we are seeking to legislate the target and why it is so important. While our government is acting Order. and working with the parliament in a constructive and open fashion, those on the other side have learnt nothing. Or well, maybe some of them have. We think some of them may have learnt something. They're ignoring the message the Australian people sent them in May, but they're also ignoring the broad coalition of support for the bill from right across the business community. The Business Council of Australia, Australian Industry Group, the Minerals Council of Australia, the Australian Institute of Company Directors, the Investor Group on Climate Change, the Australian Energy Council, the Governance Institute of Australia, Responsible Investment Association of Australia, the Australian Council on Superannuation Investors, the Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry, Rio Tinto, and the NBA NAB chair. There are plenty of others that also support these, these bills, and it's time for the opposition to support it too. Thank you, Minister. Minister uh, Senator Walsh, second supplementary. How will Australian households benefit from increased action on climate change, driven by the Albanese government's climate change agenda? Minister. Thank you. Thank you, Mr President. We haven't wasted a day on getting on with the job of cleaning up the chaos and division and dysfunction left by the previous government, with Australian households who have been paying the price. The fact is that climate change policy is energy policy and it's good economic policy. We can drive down emissions and drive down power bills at the same time. Our detailed Powering Australia plan will create 604,000 jobs, with five out of six of them to be created in the, in the regions. It will spur $76 billion worth of investment and it will deliver 82 per cent renewable energy by 2030, consistent with AEMO's step change scenario, which projects 83 per cent renewable energy. The Powering Australia plan includes modernising our ageing electricity grid, investing in renewable metals, renewable energy, 85 solar banks, 400 community batteries and 10,000 new energy apprenticeships and a new energy skills program, just showing how we can seize the opportunity that comes from this change. Thank you, Minister. Senator Bragg. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Farrell. I refer the minister to the very sensible question asked by Senator Lambie on Tuesday this week. Are there any circumstances in which it would be in the best financial interests of a superannuation account holder for their superannuation fund to make payments to a political party or to a trade union? If so, in what circumstances? Minister. Uh, thank you, uh, President, and uh, thank you, uh, Senator Bragg, for, uh, for that question. 
Um, I had the great privilege um, in a previous life of being a director of uh, one of the best um, superannuation funds in the, uh, the country, the REST, um, the REST Superannuation uh, Fund. Well, I'm just about to answer this. Senator Rustin. Um, Senator I, Farrell. Uh, don't take the bank. All right. All right. But no. Yeah, yeah that be handy. Um, uh, look, I will preface, despite uh, what uh, Senator Rustin said, I will preface uh, my, my my comments because I had 15 years' experience um, on uh, one of the best and the biggest superannuation funds in, in this country, and on not one occasion, and not one occasion was a political donation made um, to either the Liberal Party, the, the uh, Labor Senator Party or, or any other party. So um, this idea that um, industry, particularly industry um, um, super funds, are uh, out there handing out monies to political parties, particularly the Labor Party, um, is simply untrue. It's a, it's, you know, <coughs> We used to talk about we used to talk about fake news. You don't hear it that much more the, the, so often since um, President Trump has gone. But it, Mr. Um, Senator Bragg, this is fake news. This is fake news. Um, the job the job of industry superannuation funds is to get the best return for their members. And in my experience, in my experience. Every one of those funds has been doing exactly what they were asked to do by their members, and that is get the best Thank result you, possible. Thank you, Senator Farrell. Your time has expired. Senator Bragg, first supplementary. Thank you very much. Can the minister guarantee that Australian super funds will not be making any payments to political parties or to trade unions or any other politically affiliated organisation without publicly disclosing the details of such payments to their members. Minister. Uh, conversations across the yeah. chamber are disorderly. Thank you, Senator Chisholm. And the minister was on his feet to answer the question. Minister. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, President. Um, look, I can only go back to the first answer I gave you, uh, Senator, Senator Bragg. Bragg. And I know you've got, you've, you know, the whole history of. Um, the opposition has been one of opposition to industry superannuation. So any chance, any any chance that you get to bring down or uh, uh, denigrate, yeah, that's that's the word I need. Uh, thank you, Senator Billick. Uh, any chance the opposition gets to denigrate um, industry superannuation funds, they will use. Now the reality is, I, I mean, I can only give you my own experience. Um, of this, I haven't seen any evidence of, of what you're implying goes on in these uh, industry superannuation funds. But I know from my own personal experience in this area that this is not what union funds do. This is not what industry funds do. Their whole priority, their whole preference. Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Bragg, second supplementary. I thought they were super funds, not union funds. Why is the government ignoring the views of Super Consumers Australia? and the Grattan Institute and many others to unwind the provisions requiring the detailed disclosure of payments to political parties, unions and other organisations? Isn't it just because the Labor Party wants to see these funds flow back into the Labor Party? Minister. Let's talk about where you Senator Billick. Minister. Uh, thank you, President. No, Senator Bragg, what the Labor Party wants to see is the best retirement possible for Australian workers from their industry superannuation fund that that fund can deliver for them. That's, that's what the Labor Party wants. Um, and I think that's, what, that's actually what the members of industry superannuation funds want. They, want. they want the people who represent them on the boards of those organisations uh, to do their level best to get the absolute best returns. That's what the, the board members of those funds um, should be uh, should be working on. <coughs> just remember, um, I can, just 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 remember 
uh, that the job, there's, there's an obligation on every single member of a superannuation board uh, to deliver the best results for their members. And that's, that's what I believe Thank you, every Minister. single Your industry fund is doing in this country. Senator Shoebridge. President, my question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Farrell. The Prime Minister has said that the government has been working behind the scenes and engaging in quiet diplomacy regarding the extradition of Julian Assange. But quiet diplomacy can't be no diplomacy. What exactly is the government doing to secure the release of this Australian citizen, journalist and whistleblower? Minister. Uh, thank you, President. And I thank uh, uh, Senator Shoebridge for his question and congratulate him on his uh, election. I think this might be your first question. Well, good luck. And it's on, it's on a very um, important topic, and that um, relates to uh, Mr Julian Assange. Um, the Australian government has been clear in our view that um, Mr Assange's case has dragged on for too long and that it should now be brought to a close. This is the view that we continue to convey to the governments of both the United Kingdom and the United States along with our expectations that Mr Assange is entitled to, uh, to due process, humane and fair treatment, access to proper medical uh, care and access to his legal team. But as the Prime Minister um, has pointed out, not all foreign affairs is best conducted with a loud hailer or a megaphone, as we saw from the previous uh, government. It's also worth noting that the uh, extradition cases is between uh, the United States and the United Kingdom, uh, a legal system that we, uh, we respect. Australia, of course, um, is not a party to uh, Mr Assange's uh, case. Um, and uh, as the uh, legal operations uh, uh, still stand, uh, our government, uh, I'm advised, uh, cannot uh, intervene. Uh, in the legal matters of uh, another country, um, just, just like we wouldn't want um, those countries to intervene in our, uh, our legal uh, process. Um, Order. We will continue to monitor uh, the case uh, closely, and uh, we continue to seek uh, assurances from the United Kingdom uh, government about Mr Assange's uh, welfare and his treatment. Thank you, Minister. Senator Shubri, uh, first supplementary. Mr Assange's family has been seeking a meeting with Prime Minister Albanese. In fact, they're here in the building today, and I acknowledge his father, John Shipton, and brother, Gabrielle, who are in the gallery yeah. chamber just behind yeah. us. Order. Senator, Order. why won't the Prime Minister meet with the family and hear directly their concerns, which challenge what you say, concerns about Mr Assange's health, his safety and his future? Yeah. Why won't you meet? Minister. I have met uh, uh, well, Senator Shoebridge, you are disorderly. If you have a point of order, stand and make it. You don't just stand up and shout out. Minister. Minister, I'm calling you. Uh, thank you, Senator Wish Wilson. Minister. Uh, thank you. Look, um, the Prime Minister can speak for himself uh, on this uh, issue. But, but I, I, have, I have met Mr Shipton. I met him a couple of years ago. Um, Senator Farrell, please resume your seat. Um, Senator Shoebridge, please resume your seat. You don't half stand and then start shouting out a point of order. In this chamber, you stand and you wait for the call. So if you'd like to stand, and I will call your name, and then if you have a point of order, please make it. Senator Shoebridge. Point of order, President. The minister is here in his capacity representing the Prime Minister, and that's the, that what was what was put to the, the minister, and he was not being relevant in his answer. Thank you, Senator Shoebridge. Uh, I believe the minister is being relevant, and I will continue to listen carefully. And if he's not relevant, I'll point that out to him. Minister. Thank you, uh, President. Um, I have met Mr. Shipton. Um, it was a very uh, moving meeting, and I personally can't think what it would be like um, to have one of my children uh, incarcerated like um, Mr Assange um, has been incarcerated. 
Um, but look, as I said before, we don't control the legal systems of other countries. We're offering all the support that um, we can under the consular arrangements uh, for uh, Mr Shipton's uh, son. And um, the Prime Minister has said he wants an end to these uh, proceedings. I mean, I don't think he can be clearer. Thank you, Minister. Uh, than, Your time uh, than... has expired. Senator Shubri, second supplementary. President, um, through you, President, the Prime Minister has previously said enough is enough, and you've repeated it here today, Senator. And the government has called for the USA to bring this matter to a close previously. By bringing matters to a close, do you mean allowing Mr Assange to be extradited to the USA, charged and convicted and sentenced for over a century in jail, and then perhaps seeking a prison transfer? Thank you, Senator Shoebridge. Minister. Um, thank you, um, uh, thank you, uh, President, and uh, thank uh, Senator Shoebridge for his um, his question. Um, look, the the Prime Minister has been extremely clear about what the policy and the position of the Australian government uh, is. We want we want to bring this uh, matter to uh, to a close. I think it's worth making a couple of uh, couple of points. Um, that Mr Assange actually withdrew in June uh, 2019 his consent for us to inquire about his health and his personal circumstances, and we've sought to receive assurances. Well, despite no, I'm not blaming. I am not blaming him, Senator uh, Shoebridge. I'm not blaming him. I'm simply pointing out that he withdrew. He withdrew um, consular assistance that the Australian government was providing. Oh yeah. Um, well, I've told you what I've done. I've, um, I've met with Mr Minister, uh, Shipton. Minister Farrell, please direct your answers to the chair. Please continue. I believe the time has expired. Thank you. Senator Ciccone. Thank you very much, President. My question is to the Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry, Senator Watt. Exotic animal diseases such as foot mouth disease and lumpy skin disease have the potential to pose a very serious threat to our livestock industry. Can the minister please update the Senate on the steps that this government is taking to ensure that our nation is prepared should an outbreak occur? Minister Watt. Thank you, President. Thank you, Senator Giacconi, for your ongoing interest in this important matter. As I have consistently said, the first point to make in anything regarding this matter is that Australia remains foot and mouth disease free. And the Albanese government is working hard in partnership with the states, territories and industries to keep it that way. While the risk of foot and mouth disease or lumpy skin disease entering Australia is low, it is not zero. And as I've said before, experts have assessed the risk of a foot and mouth disease outbreak in Australia over the next five years at 11.6 per cent and a lumpy skin disease outbreak at 28 per cent. We cannot assume it will state that way and that's why we, keep ne we need to keep doing more. I've previously spoken of our two-pronged approach, taking action at home and abroad, and I'm pleased to announce today a new third prong, taking action now to ensure we are fully prepared if an outbreak were to occur here. That's why earlier today I announced the creation of a new exotic animal disease task force to ensure Australia is fully prepared to respond swiftly to growing biosecurity threats. The task force will thoroughly assess our current level of national preparedness and advise of any improvements needed. While the federal, state and territory governments all have well-developed biosecurity response plans in place, we will leave no stone unturned to ensure that we are ready should an outbreak occur. Importantly, this task force will be a vehicle for collaboration across the Commonwealth and will be co-chaired by senior officials from the Department of Agriculture and Emergency Management Australia. It will also include officials from the Defence Force, Border Force and Animal Health Australia. By bringing together the best expertise from across government, we can ensure there are, no, there are no gaps in our response. I note the National Farmers Federation has welcomed this announcement, saying that, quote, it's, a, it's the right idea. And this continues the close partnership between the Albanese government and industry in managing biosecurity. Good governments plan for the best and prepare for the worst. That's exactly what we're Thank doing. Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Giacconi, first supplementary. Thank you very much, President, and I thank the Minister for that answer. And I'm sure the industry is very much appreciative of the decisive action that you're taking on this matter. Could you please explain to uh, the Senate the role that the state and territory governments will play in preparing for a potential biosecurity outbreak in Australia? Minister Watt. 
Thank you, Senator Ciccone. Uh, as I have said before, biosecurity is everyone's responsibility, from the federal government through to state and territory governments, as well as farmers, importers, exporters and international travellers. Last night, I spoke with each state and territory agriculture minister to inform them of the establishment of the Federal Exotic Animal Disease Preparedness Task Force and to discuss their own efforts to prepare for a foot and mouth disease or lumpy skin disease outbreak should one occur. While the task force will be comprised of federal officials, it will work closely with states and territories. We have also spoken with industry to ensure that their views are being heard and they will be engaged to assist the task force as required. It is this spirit of collaboration and desire to work together to ensure that state and federal government response plans are robust that is a hallmark of the Albanese government and is something that is deeply appreciated by all levels of government as well as industry. Uh, on this side of the chamber, we're focused on getting the job done because this Thank issue you, and Senator the people it affects are more important than politics. Ciccone, second supplementary. Thank you, President. Uh, no doubt uh, preparedness is the key to when it comes to dealing with these outbreaks, as we've heard from the minister's uh, answer to my uh, first and second question. Can the minister please advise the Senate what lessons have been taken from the management of previous, previous disease outbreaks in this country? Minister. Thank you again, Senator Ciccone. Uh, as we all remember, the response to COVID-19 was the most important global human health response in recent memory. If we have learned one thing from this experience, it is that the Australian government needs to be prepared ahead of time for an event as potentially catastrophic as an outbreak of foot and mouth disease. And that means working with all levels of government in a constructive and respectful way. We are determined to not make the same mistakes the previous government did. When COVID hit, the former coalition government wasn't prepared. They were slow to close borders, leaving management to the states, slow on rats and too slow on vaccines. And of course, Australians paid the price. When floods and fires hit, the former coalition government wasn't prepared. When the ex-fire chiefs tried to warn them about what was coming, the former government wouldn't even meet them. We won't make the same mistake. If there, if there were to be a major biosecurity outbreak in Australia, there is simply no time for delay, and that's why we've implemented the strongest biosecurity response ever and why we will Thank keep you, working White, on preparedness. Your time has expired. Senator Tyrrell. Thank you, President. My question is for the minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Minister Gallagher. Minister, there are a lot of elderly people in my neck of the woods who rely on community carers to get transport to and from doctors' appointments, mow their lawns and clean their house. Like all of us, the people running community care are paying more on fuel, wages, insurance and rent. But the funding for home care packages and the Commonwealth Home Support Program is only going up 1.7 per cent this year. How does your government expect community care providers to survive on so little? Senator Gallagher. Thank you, President. And I thank Senator Tyrrell for the question. I think it's your first question. Senator Tyrrell, so congratulations on that and um, appreciate um, a bit of the heads up that you gave on this as well. Um, you raised the issue of uh, support for home care and community care uh, services and the indexation rate. This is an issue that has been raised with me in my role as the Minister for Finance, uh, not just um, from an aged care point of view, but um, from a from the majority of those working in the non-government sector at the moment. Um, so this is something that I am looking at closely. There are a range of different ways that um, indexation applies across payments um, and programs and even differences between um, particular programs get uh, indexed differently. So I am having a pretty close look at that. My understanding is that the Department of Health and Aged Care is aware of the issue. They're working with the sector um, and looking at a range of approaches to manage some of these um, impacts on, on the service provision. Um, I would say that there has been significant investment into the service system over the last couple of years, but the government accepts that um, with inflation running as, as high as it is, that that is having costs on services. And um, you know, it's a matter I'm looking at as Minister for Finance. Thank you, Minister. Senator Tyrrell, first supplementary. Uh, we have organisations in Tasmania who say they'll have to close up shop within the next couple of months. They can't afford to survive. Will the government consider emergency funding to keep the lights on for community care? Minister. Uh, thank you, um, 
President, and I would say if there are organisations that are um, are in that position, then I hope that they would be actively engaging with the Department of Health and Aged Care in particular, uh, or the relevant department for which they receive their funding. As I said, there are a range of different ways, uh, different indexation arrangements across government. Um, the government would not want to see um, essential community services cease. Um, providing services. Um, they are essential and particularly um, in, in areas where you know, there might not be choice of service as well, where um, restrictions are, in, are there just because of the nature of the service system. So I would say in the first instance, well, I would say the government doesn't want to see any of those services close uh, based on escalating costs and we would ask that the um, organisations either engage with the department or with the minister's office. Thank you, Minister. Senator Tyrrell, second supplementary. Thank you, President. Minister, residential aged care is getting a 10 per cent increase in funding in October, but the new Australian national aged care classification won't apply to organisations who help older Australians in their family home. Why shouldn't aged care, community care sorry, get the same support as residential care? Minister. Uh, thank you, um, President. And I would say, uh, yes, residential aged care gets a lot of, I think, the public attention, uh, but the government accepts that home care and community care is an essential part of our um, service system for supporting older Australians. Um, it, it, it has received increases in funding. I would note that in, uh, since we've come to government, we have delayed um, the implementation for the new in-home aged care program by 12 months. Um, because we had been getting feedback from people about it being too rigid to support older Australians and the conditions and circumstances and the, the nature of how support is provided. So that is something that we're doing and, and we will consult widely and, and talk to all of those organisations about the best way forward. But our position is that we need that extra 12 months. That's in line with the Royal Commission. Uh, and whilst there are significant resources, I think in the order of uh, over six billion dollars a year going into you, um, Minister, your home time care has expired. at the moment. Senator Davey. Thank you very much. Uh, my question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Farrell. Uh, in 2012, when announcing an additional 450 gigalitres of water recovery over and above sustainable diversion limits detailed in the Basin Plan, then Prime Minister Julia Gillard said the water will be recovered via Water, and I quote, water recovery projects that minimise the impact on communities to ensure there is no social and economic downside for communities, end quote. This intent was then written into the 2012 Basin Plan. Does the new Labor government stand by the 2012 commitment to communities for no negative social and economic impacts? Thank you, Senator Davies. Minute. Davey, Minister. Um, thank you, uh, thank you, President, and uh, thank uh, Senator Davey for her uh, for, for her question. Um, what the um, federal uh, Albanese uh, government uh, stands by, uh, Senator, and what uh, Minister Plibersek stands by, is the commitment that uh, we made when we were last in government. Uh, to restore the health of that mighty river system, the Murray-Darling uh, River system, uh, and in, in doing that, uh, ensure that the 450 gigalitres of water that was promised to that river system uh, is delivered upon. Um, we don't want life to be any harder for um, inland uh, inland communities in this country. Um, there was significant consultation at the time that that uh, plan was, uh, was, uh, was delivered. Uh, I, I, in fact, was the, the deputy uh, um, water minister to Minister Burke, no, to Minister Burke who delivered that system. Um, we made a promise to the people of Australia. We made a promise um, to all of those people who, whose um, Life, livelihood um, survives along that, uh, along that river system. Uh, and the promise that we made was uh, we'll deliver that 450 gigalitres of water. Now, it wasn't just the federal government that entered into that uh, um, understanding, that promise. Uh, it was all of the state governments 
uh, including um, those governments that uh, <coughs> are of a liberal persuasion now, like New South Wales. So the federal government, uh, the state governments, all committed to the delivery of that 450 gigalitres. Thank you, Minister. And Your time we intend to for do it. answering has expired. Senator Davey, first supplementary. So I take it as a no about your commitment to communities. But uh, in 2018, you, you mentioned uh, Basin State Ministers, and I appreciate the segue. Senator in 2018, Davey. all Basin State Ministers, including the Labor South Australian Minister and the Labor Victorian Minister, agreed to a set of criteria by which they could assess that there would be no negative social or economic impacts from this water recovery. Does the new Labor government respect the I'll consensus Sorry, of the Senator Ministerial Davies Council? Time. Minister. Uh, thank you, uh, President, and thank you, um, uh, thank you uh, Senator Davey, for, uh, for her follow-up uh, question. Um, let's look at what the nine years of the previous government delivered for these communities and what they delivered uh, Minister, for— Minister, please resume your seat. Senator, uh, Senator Davey, wait for the call. Senator Davey. Uh, point of order relevance. It was a very specific question. I wasn't asking about a history lesson. I was asking about the Basin Ministerial Council. Well, the minister had just uh, started his response, and I will listen carefully, and if he's not relevant, I will draw him to the question. Please continue, Minister. Um, thank you, President. I don't see anything inconsistent with what you've just read out. Has, that has been the commitment of the state governments to what the Labor Party committed to when we were in government um, more than nine years ago, and that is the delivery of 450 gigalitres of water. I notice we haven't got one of the South Australians uh, asking this, uh, this question. Um, no, yes, no, no. The there. South Australians haven't asked this question because they know that the most important um, thing for the South Australian community, and I'm speaking now as a South Australian uh, senator, is the delivery of that 450 gigalitres. How much did you deliver in Thank the nine you, years of your government? Time has Two gigalitres. Senator Davey. Second supplementary order. Uh, thank you. Both New South Wales and Victoria have said on record that they are opposed to buyback. Yeah, yeah. The states are integral to delivering other aspects of the Basin Plan, such as constraints management. Uh, in an interview with the Adelaide Advertiser, Ms Plibersek has said that she is open to buybacks. What will the government do if the states walk away from the Basin Plan? Thank you, Senator Davey. Minister. Well, I, I would plead with the states not to walk away from the Basin Plan, because the one, the one, the one bit of hope that the Murray-Darling Basin has is that we deliver on what was agreed more than nine years ago, 450 gigalitres of water. If we don't, if we don't, we risk the ongoing survival. If we don't, we risk Senator the ongoing McKenzie. survival Senator of McKenzie. that fan. Senator Sorry. McKenzie, the minister's answering. Please listen. Please continue, Minister. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that protection from Senator McKenzie. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, we want a, live, a, a life and a life-giving river system in this country. We know from the, the, uh, uh, the droughts in the early part of this century, just what it did to the communities along those rivers, and we know what it did to people in South Australia. Uh, what um, Minister Plebisek says Minister, is right. Your time we has will expired. do whatever. Minister, uh, Senator Babet. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Climate Change, Senator Gallagher. Minister, the CSIRO states that energy production is the largest contributor to Australia's carbon dioxide output. The government has made it clear that it intends to ramp through legislation which would see a reduction in carbon dioxide output of 43 per cent. I am concerned that this will cause energy prices to increase. Australian families are already struggling with the cost of living pressures. Can the minister make the Senate aware of how the government will achieve these cuts in emissions, and will this result in increased power prices for the average Australian? Thank you, Senator Babette. Minister. 
Uh, thank you, um, President. I thank Senator Babette for the uh, question and also for the heads up of, on the question um, today. And also, I don't think I congratulated you last week on the first question. I know it's the second one because I got you first, so congratulations on both of them. Um, in terms of our in, in terms of our plan, um, the legislation that has passed uh, the House uh, earlier today and will come to the Senate now implements our election commitment to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 43 per cent. We went to the election with uh, very detailed modelling on how we would achieve that. Um, the Powering Australia plan, which is available uh, to all online, um, but the clear uh, impact of that modelling showed that um, if we were to implement it, which is um, you know, to ensure that we are building a new grid uh, to enable 82 per cent uh, renewable energy by 2030, um, that we are providing the investment certainty that is needed to um, allow those investment dollars to flow and to invest in new energy technology, to invest in solar banks, community batteries, uh, to build the workforce, uh, to also uh, reduce taxes on electric vehicles, uh, that it would also uh, put downward pressure on energy prices. Now, I think we all accept that um, you know, the previous government did nothing for nine years and left us in a situation where we have escalating electricity prices in particular that they hid from the community before the last election, 19.7 per cent increase in electricity prices. Uh, our plan, which is the cheapest form of energy at the moment, is renewable energy. Uh, the cost of coal is expected to be $141, um, gas $133 by 2030. In contrast, the cost of renewables, which we want to invest in, is $63, Thank you, Minister. Your $63 time has expired. per megawatt hour. Uh, Senator Babette, first supplementary. According to the CSIRO, energy production accounts for approximately 33 per cent of Australia's total carbon dioxide output. What other sectors will be taxed or potentially axed in order to achieve your 2030 target? Minister. Uh, thank you. And our plan uh, details how we would achieve the 43 per cent reduction by 2030, which uh, doesn't involve tax or ax. Uh, it's a comprehensive and transparent plan. Uh, it involves modernising Australia's ageing energy electricity grid through the Rewiring the Nation plan, the $3 billion investment in renewable metals, renewable energy, uh, component manufacturing, renewable hydrogen, electrolysers, 85 solar banks, 400 community batteries um, and investments in um, our workforce to make sure that we have the workforce to deliver on those. 604,000 jobs, five out of six of them in the region, $76 billion worth of investment. Uh, this is the opportunity that the Australian people need their government to seize, to drive jobs, to lower power prices, to invest in the new technologies of the future and ensure that we can seize um, the, e the energy improvements that we need uh, to bring down our gas, um, greenhouse Thank gas you, emissions. Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Yeah. Senator Babette, second supplementary. Agriculture accounts for approximately 14.6 per cent of carbon dioxide output. Can the minister guarantee our hard-working farmers that the government will not sacrifice their livelihoods in order to achieve any of these targets? Minister. Um, again, thank you and th uh, thanks Senator Babbitt for the question. We've been upfront about our plans. We won't be cutting agricultural production. The National Farmers Federation supports our updated targets. There are huge opportunities, I think, in the agricultural sector. I know that uh, Minister Watt is engaging with all of the stakeholders on, on those, and we have broad-ranging support right across industry for this plan because they know after 10 years of this lot, they see what's happening out there, exactly. they see the opportunities, the jobs and the improvements for their areas that will come from having a government that can provide industry with the certainty they need to make the investments and make the change that is coming. It's not only important for, any, for our power bills and prices, it's important for jobs and it's important for those essential industries like agriculture who will be part of the change. Thank you, Minister. Senator Green. 
Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Farrell. As Australia is a proud sporting nation, and I'm sure senators across the chamber are watching closely the performance of the Australian team at the Birmingham Commonwealth Games, can the minister update the Senate on the performance of the Australian Commonwealth Games team in Birmingham? Minister. No, I've given you the call. Sorry, Minister. Um, thank you, uh, President, and thank uh, uh, Senator Green for that uh, question. I know she's an avid sports fan, and uh, We'll be looking forward to the Olympics um, in her great state of Queensland uh, in uh, um, just under 10 years' time. But yes, I can give you some uh, good news there, uh, uh, Senator. Uh, Australia is leading the medal board at the uh, Birmingham Games. Um, too many medalists uh, to name them all today, but I'll just go through a few highlights. Uh, Emma McKeon is the greatest Commonwealth Games athlete of all times, with 14 total medals uh, and six won at these uh, uh, games. Ariana Titmus uh, finished her extraordinary games campaign with gold and, has, uh, and a games record in the uh, 400 meter uh, freestyle. Sprinter Evan O'Hanlon uh, claimed the uh, Australian athletics teams 200th Commonwealth uh, Games gold gold uh, gold medal. Oh, now Senator Birmingham, how could you say that? Ah, Birmingham, Birmingham Commonwealth Games. Um, our oldest, <laughs> our oldest team member and national treasure, 63-year-old lawn bowler Cheryl Linfield, uh, has made a remarkable Commonwealth Games uh, de debut at that uh, age. Uh, winning the silver medal with uh, her uh, partner, Serena uh, Bonnell. Um, we wish uh, the remaining participants all the best for the, uh, the rest of these games and uh, look forward uh, to greeting them uh, triumphantly when they, uh, when they return to, uh, to Australia, uh, which, which, uh, which hopefully will be very soon to uh, a glorious uh, reception. Thank you, Minister. Senator Green, first supplementary. Oh, thanks, President. Thank you to the Minister for the fantastic news. Many of today's Commonwealth Games athletes owe their success to the pre previous investment by Australian governments in grassroots sports. Can the Minister outline the importance of proper investment in grassroots sports for the success of our Commonwealth Games teams? Minister. Um, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, President, and thanks uh, once again for that uh, very incisive uh, question from uh, Senator Green. And yes, I can uh, tell you uh, a little bit about uh, the, uh, the matter that you raised. Um, grassroots sport uh, investment uh, has been a feature of Australian governments uh, at uh, both the uh, federal and uh, uh, state level, and certainly was so under Minister uh, Colbeck, who's now probably now very proud about our, uh, our achievements uh, in, uh, in Birmingham. Sporting clubs uh, promote and train uh, junior athletes uh, who are the future representatives of, uh, of our country. Those uh, future sports stars rely on uh, change rooms, ovals, lightings that sporting grants programs have provided. In those sporting clubs that have put their faith in government to provide unbiased funding through a fair system across the board. I'd like to acknowledge uh, our new sports minister who took over from, uh, from me. Thank you, uh, Minister. Your time Annika has Wells. expired. Uh, Senator Green, second supplementary. Uh, thank you, Minister. And after such positive news, I, I, I really do regret to ask this, but has there been anything which has negatively impacted investment in grassroots sporting teams across Australia, which may put at risk the performance of the Australian Commonwealth Games team into the future? Minister. What could that be? Thank you, President. Look, I am. Yeah, thank you, Senator, uh, Senator Green, for that question. Look, I am disappointed. Uh, to go back into uh, to go back into time, but who could forget the sports rorts affair of this former government uh, and uh, the so-called colour-coded spreadsheets, which we still haven't yet got an explanation for. And uh, despite an inquiry that was conducted by uh, uh, minister, uh, minister, yes, uh, Assistant Minister uh, uh, Chisholm. We still haven't got answers to what went on there, and uh, all Minister, of the electorates. Minister, that... please resume your seat. Uh, Senator Rustin. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Senator Watt. Yeah. 
Yeah, I'm waiting to call Senator Rustin. Mm. Senator uh, thank Rustin. you very much, um, President. I was just wondering, on the matter of relevance, whether the minister thought that our parallel infusions were relevant of maybe a mention. Oh, here, that's here. not a point of order. Uh, thank you, Minister. Senator Green. Um, of course, of course, they are Senator uh, Rustin, and uh, they uh, uh, their uh, achievements have been uh, absolutely amazing as well. And thank you for drawing that. Well, I, I, just, I don't ask the questions. Uh, Senator Green, ask the questions. Uh, Senators. Um, Senators, the electorates, order. the electorates that missed out for order. being on the wrong side of the. Thank you, Minister. I thought... Your time has expired. Please resume your seat. Order, order, Senator Brockman. Thank you, Madam President. My question is to the Minister for, wait for it, wait for it, Trade and Tourism, Senator Farrell. I refer the Minister. Order. I, I, I refer the minister to the importance of technical innovations in land management, agronomics and seed varieties. Will the minister guarantee that trade agreements and negotiations will not contain any provisions that detrimentally impact Australian farmers' ability to access the most modern farming techniques? Thank you, Senator Brockman. Minister. Well, I certainly will stand up for Australian farmers uh, and manufacturers uh, and wine producers and uh, barley producers, barley produ meat producers, crayfish producers, all the people, all the people that you have failed to look after over the last nine years. Order. What a disgrace. When we, when we lost those markets, when we lost those markets Order. to the sort of farmers that no the sort of farmers that uh, <coughs> Senator Brockman is talking about on the uh, Air Peninsula or the York Peninsula, who make amazing products, uh, we are going to look after them. And I can assure Senator Brockman that in every single um, enter, uh, free trade agreement that we enter into, uh, we will ensure the interests of our farmers are protected in a way that was never done, that was never done, that was never ever done by the former government in the last nine years. Now, I can, I can tell you a few things Order. about this, Senator Brockman. Look, look this government, this, this, this opposition, when they were in government, negotiated a free trade agreement with the United Kingdom that would have, would have very significantly benefited both the farmers in your state, Senator, uh, Senator Brockman, and uh, f farmers in my state. What happened? That was negotiated. What happened? That, that was negotiated last December. Exactly. There are requirements under our legislation to implement those free trade agreements. Uh, Minister, please resume your seat. Order, order, order. Senator O'Neill. Senator Brockman. Um, my question did not refer to what occurred under the previous government. We are asking. Um, What's what, your point? You're going to laugh about the importance of trade agreements to Australian agriculture, you, Senator, Senator Brockman. What? Senator you're Brockman. going to laugh about that. Senator Brockman, resume your seat. Order. There is uh, no uh, point of order because uh, Senator Farrell is being relevant. Please continue. Thank you, President. I, I thought they were—I thought they were being so well behaved. Uh, I wasn't sure why it was, but look. Um, but I can tell you, I can tell you that 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 free trade agreement was negotiated last year, and by all accounts, it was a very good agreement. I'm not criticising the agreement, but not a single uh, step. Senator Farrell, please resume your seat. Senator Birmingham. Uh, point of order, President, uh, both in terms of relevance to the question asked by Senator Brockman, but also in terms of honesty, seeing as members of the uh, Joint Standing Senator Committee Birmingham. on Treaties from the Labor Party Senator who Birmingham. wanted more hearings and delayed Birmingham. conclusion of consideration of it. Senator Birmingham. I am order. Senator O'Neill. I am going to remind senators that a point of order is not an opportunity to debate points. You make your point of order, I make a ruling which you may or may not agree with, and then we continue on. I believe that uh, 
The minister is being relevant. He's got five seconds remaining. Please continue, Minister. Um, Senator Brockman, I'll guarantee and I'll ensure that we look after all Thank of the— Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Brockman, first supplementary. Will the minister guarantee to protect the right of Australian farmers, farmers to use important agricultural chemicals such as glyphosate and atrazine that have been approved by the Australian regulator and used by Australian dry land farmers to prevent erosion and preserve soil moisture? Thank you, Senator Brockman. Minister. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, thank you, President, and uh, thank you, uh, Senator Brockman, for your for, for your question. Um, we'll continue to do um, exactly what uh, we've said to do in, said we would do in opposition, uh, and that uh, we are now in government, and that is ensure that we negotiate the best possible uh, enterprise. Uh, uh, what am I saying? Uh, free trade agreements. Um, <laughs> Free, tr <laughs> free trade, free trade, flashback, Order. flashback. Well, let Order. me. I'll Minister. Take, I'll take. Minister. I'll take. I'll take. Minister. Order. I'll, I'll take that intervention Minister. because because let me Minister tell you. Farrell. Let me tell you, Senator Birmingham. Minister. Let me. Minister, I have asked you to resume your seat, and I would ask. Senators, particularly on this side, Senator Cash. To Senator Brockman, I will come to you. I will ask you to listen quietly and not be so disorderly that it took me about four times shouting to sit the minister down. Now, Senator Brockman. On a point of order, Madam President. On a point of order. Yes. Uh, the question was very narrow on direct relevance. The question was very narrow. Glyphosate and atrazine dry land farmers. The minister has gone nowhere near it. I believe that a minister is being relevant, but quite frankly, with the, with the disorderly shouting and carrying on, particularly from the left, it was impossible for me to hear the minister. Uh, Minister, you have 21 seconds remaining, and I believe you have been relevant, and I would expect you to remain relevant to the question. Please continue. Yeah, thank you, uh, President, for that exhortation, and I certainly will continue to remain uh, relevant. Um, Senator Cash, Senator Cash, calm down, calm down, Senator Cash. We we will we we will do everything we can in terms of our international negotiations. This morning, I met with all of the ambassadors. Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Brockman. Will the minister guarantee to protect the right of Australian farmers to use GM technology, such as, such as genetically modified canola, which is approved by the Australian regulator for use by Australian grain farmers? Thank you, Senator Brockman. Minister. Uh, thank you, President, and uh, thank uh, Senator Brockman for the, uh, the question. Uh, I won't disappoint Senator, uh, Senator Cash. Um, I met with all of the um, European uh, ambassadors this morning uh, to discuss the very subject matter that you're talking about in terms of uh, a European uh, free trade agreement. Um, these discussions allow both parties to um, raise issues. Um, from our point of view, we'll be seeking to re represent the best interests uh, of all um, our uh, agricultural producers, as well as manufacturers and everybody else, uh, our miners, <coughs> all of those groups who've got an interest in this, uh, in this free trade agreement. Um, we intend to get the best possible results for this country. That includes um, everybody who works uh, in the farming, uh, farming sector. Senator McGrath. Yes, it, well, you can take Senator it. You can, McGrath. You can take it as a guarantee, uh, Senator McGrath, because um, Thank you, Minister. all of Your my, time has all expired. of the skills. Minister. Um, it time's up. Uh, <laughs> I, I. Order. Order. I, I ask that further questions be placed on the notice paper. Thank you. Senators, before we move to taking note, I um, have a statement on a matter of privilege. 
By letter dated the 25th of May 2022, the Chair of the Environment and Communications References Committee, Senator Hanson Young, has raised a matter of privilege relating to the failure of representatives of a resource company, Tambaran Resources Limited, to attend and give evidence to the committee when ordered to do so. I table the letter. The matter was the subject of an interim report of the committee's inquiry into oil and gas exploration and production in the Beedaloo Basin. Senator Hanson Young seeks to have the conduct of the company's representatives referred to the Privileges Committee for inquiry as a possible contempt. Where a matter of privilege is raised, my role is to determine whether it should have precedence in debate. In doing so, I am guided by the Senate's privilege resolutions, which seek to reserve the Senate's contempt powers for matters involving substantial obstruction to the Senate and its committees or to senators performing their duties. The Senate has declared in Privilege Resolution 6 that disobedience of lawful Senate orders and refusal to attend before a committee when ordered to do so may be dealt with as contempts. On the question of obstruction, the Chair's letter notes that the committee has been prevented from examining key evidence as a result, completing its inquiry and reporting to the Senate. Only the Senate can remedy such conduct, so in my view the relevant criteria are met. I have therefore determined that it would be appropriate to grant the matter precedence as a matter of privilege. However, given that the matter was raised by a committee of the previous parliament, I intend to ask the newly established References Committee whether it wishes to proceed in the Senate at this time or whether it wishes to consider other actions first. This might include reiterating the requirement for the witnesses to attend with the knowledge that preliminary steps have been taken to have the matter dealt with as a contempt. If the committee wishes to proceed with the matter in the Senate, it will be dealt with as a matter of privilege. It will then be for the Senate to determine whether the matter warrants investigation as a possible contempt. Minister. In question time today, in response to a question from uh, Senator Rustin about the rates of third and fourth doses in residential aged care, I undertook to come back to uh, the Senator with the, uh, the figures. I can confirm the third dose rate is 94 per cent of the eligible population in residential care, and the fourth dose rate is 79.4 uh, per cent of eligible population in residential care. And I uh, hope this uh, assists the uh, senator and the promptness of the reply. Yep. Uh, senator Farrell. Uh, thank you, uh, Acting uh, Deputy President. Yesterday in question time, Senator Hanson asked Senator Wong whether the government would legislate for aged pensioners to be able to take on more work without penalty to their benefits and give independent retirees, who are no burden on the taxpayer, the same opportunities to fill our critical work shortages. In response, Senator Wong indicated that she would answer what she could and ensure that if there was more information that can be provided to you, uh, that that is provided to Senator Hanson. In Senator Wong's absence and as Minister representing the Minister for Social Services, I table a response I have provided to the Senator uh, to Senator Hanson. I table that now. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Deputy President. Um, as much as it pains me, but um, because the, the minister has been so kind today, uh, I move that the Senate takes note of the answer given by Senator Farrell to the question from Senator Brockman. Uh, Deputy President, the, the current negotiations in relation to the EU uh, free trade agreement are extremely important, and the questions raised by Senator Brockman likewise are extremely important. Australian farmers uh, are some of the least subsidised in the world, unlike a lot of their counterparts in other jurisdictions, uh, and, and so, consequently uh, they are the most innovative uh, and 
some of the most competitive in the world. Mr. President, sorry, uh, Deputy President, um, they need to retain access to all of the innovations that they have um, developed and built over time through significant investment, I might say, by themselves and by the Australian government through the Australian uh, government's research and development corporations. It's important to note, Deputy President, that uh, over the, last, the term of the last government, the last nine years, the most successful government in history in relation to the uh, negotiation of free trade agreements, commencing uh, with the free trade agreement with uh, Korea very early uh, in our time back in government, but increasing the share of trade covered by free trade agreements from 27 per cent to over 70 per cent. And if the government were to uh, ratify the free trade agreements that sit there with India and the UK, that number will go to over 80 per cent of Australia's trade. Very important figures. So I would urge the government to ensure that uh, the work of the um, uh, committee that's considering the free trade agreements is progressed, but to ensure in the negotiations that, as Senator Farrell said in his answer, our farmers are protected in, the re in respect of the use of those critical uh, farming methods and tools uh, that go to our capacity to maintain our land quality, which is extremely important. And Australian farmers have done a brilliant job in developing those technologies and those systems uh, all over Australia, I might add. Uh, and also those critical um, uh, chemicals and supports that allow them to do that. Uh, as, as we indicated during the question previously, not only does it prevent erosion, does it uh, help to support so soil quality, but it also helps them to sequester carbon. So important elements and maintaining access to those things and not disadvantaging Australian farmers in trade is going to be extremely important. The record of the previous government in respect of free trade agreements with agreements signed with Korea, Japan, China, Hong Kong, Peru, Indonesia and, of course, across the Indo-Pacific um, have opened up enormous opportunities for farmers in this country. Uh, we need to maintain those opportunities. We continue, need to continue to grow them. That's why we commenced and completed the negotiations with the UK. It's disappointing that in the previous parliament uh, the proceedings inside the uh, treaties committee uh, was delayed by seeking additional hearings. Uh, I certainly hope that that can be progressed quickly now that we're into this new parliament so that the farmers do get those opportunities that come from the UK, UK free trade agreement and also the free trade agreement with India. Because those opportunities, that expansion of, of, of markets, as we've seen through the disruption over the last couple of years, is extremely important to Australian agriculture. Uh, the, the, the option to be able to look at different markets when a, a disruption occurs in one significant market is now very well understood by us all. But let's not forget that the previous government, through all of its work, opened up so many opportunities more than any other government in history, and bearing in mind that the government before us did not complete a single free trade agreement, the challenge sits there right now for this government to not only ratify the two free trade agreements that have been completed just before the election—the challenge sits there for them to do that—but particularly in the negotiations with the free trade agreement for Europe, and I know Senator Farrell, Minister Farrell, would understand that only too well from his involvement in the wine industry. There are some particular protections that are very, very sensitive to Australian agriculture, and he needs to protect those. Senator O'Neill. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy President. And uh, I rise uh, in response to the contribution we've just heard from Senator Colbeck and to enhance the comments that have been put on the record today by our fine new Minister for Trade, uh, Minister Farrell. 
Uh, Minister Farrell happens to be a good friend of mine, and I particularly uh, felt encouraged by his deep knowledge of the wine industry uh, from his own life experience, uh, because I'm sure that he'll be out there fighting not only for the wine industry but for all elements of the agricultural industry, which is such a vital part not only of Australia's economic sense of uh, engagement with the world, but also in our sense of our, ourselves as a nation. We know that we are critical to the way in which the planet can eat food moving around the world we know has been profoundly interrupted by what's going on in the Ukraine. And I know that there are calls on Australia right now to step up and interact in, uh, in trade in markets that have been profoundly disrupted, not only uh, by that war but also the supply chain problems that we see as a consequence of the COVID-19 reality. Now, trade opportunities for Australians are vitally important to the Australian people. And not only will Senator Farrell be leading the charge on that, uh, I and other members will be new members on that treaties committee. And I find it very disappointing, given how important it is to our economy, that we've had questions that seek to really create by a, 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 partisan, a partisan view of what uh, should be happening in the area of trade. On parliamentary delegations, I'm pleased to let people know that as we move around the world, we go out as Team Australia to fight for our country. And it should be the same case with trade negotiations and the establishment of uh, trade deals that benefit the country. It doesn't help our cause that the, government, the previous government, now in opposition, are going to moan and bleat about uh, what's going on right now when they actually failed on their own, uh, on their own evidence here before the, the parliament today that there are the India and the UK free trade deals are just sitting there waiting to be implemented. And that's classically what we saw with this government. So many failures to show up and actually do the day job of government that's required to get on with the hard yards of actually bringing those agreements to fruition undertaking the necessary work through treaties and through good conversation behind the scenes to bring forward a good outcome for Australia. As uh, Senator Colbeck said, the India and UK, UK trade deals are just sitting there. The former government allowed them to sit there and failed to manage the processes of the government properly to deliver an advantage to this country. And because of that, that for that very common phenomenon that we saw with this previous government of sitting on their hands, waiting for things to get done that they were responsible for, that they failed to enact, we are in a situation where we could be at least six months down the track in advancing the India and UK deals. Senator Farrell spoke also about his work this morning in meeting with the trade ministers of the, uh, with, with a delegation from the EU. Uh, bigger market we could not hope to actually deliver a trade deal with. And I'm very pleased that the negotiations are no longer being done by those opposite, but uh, Minister Farrell, who will act in the national interest, and I know that he'll do everything he can to uh, diminish the partisan nature of the sort of question that we had today. A bipartisanship in these matters is absolutely critical for the success of this country. Um, in terms of Australia and our free trade, we do need to have a continuing growth of arrangements put into force. At the moment, we've got 16 free trade agreements in force, and I think that we can do much better than that as a Labor government who's willing to talk to the key participants and who is willing to actually show up in this place, do the work here in the parliament and the work in the sessions in between, where we reach out and we work with business, we work with integrity with our partners across the world to make sure that we get the very best possible outcomes, and not just for agriculture, but for the entire, for the entire sectors right across the Australian economy. We know that it's critical that trade deals with Asia are further enhanced, and I have confidence once again in Senator Farrell to make sure that the necessary relationships to make those deals work, to make them stick and to enhance them to the benefit of this nation will be undertaken. 65.2 per cent of Australia's two-way trade was with Asian countries. And uh, the fact that China was a major partner of trade worth of 251.1 billion. Thank you, Senator O'Neill. Senator McGrath. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. And I'd like to support the contribution 
and the motion moved by, by my friend Senator Colbeck. And there is a fascinating fact I want people to know about, and that is when it comes to free trade, there's a fun fact it's, you know, for the kids up there to take home and tell their mum and dad, did you know this? Um, how many free trade agreements were signed by the Labor Party when they were last in government? How many were signed? Like, show us your fingers. How many, how many do you think were signed, uh, our school students? I'll tell you how many were signed. It wasn't five, it wasn't four, it wasn't ten, it wasn't seven. It was zero. A big, fat zero. It was a big, fat, ugly zero. That's how many free trade agreements were signed by the Labor Party when they were last in power. Now, uh, just a terrible record when it comes to free trade. Because the issue with the Labor Party is, when it comes to free trade, there's a word in free trade that they don't like, and that is free. Because the Labor Party don't like freedom. They don't like the fact that businesses can get out there and make a buck. They don't like the fact that businesses can get out there, make some money, employ some people and grow the economy. Because as, as, as my good friend, we all like Senator Farrell, when he was talking about free trade agreements, he made a, a Freudian slip, and it was a classic Freudian slip. Because he wasn't talking about um, a, a negotiating a free trade agreement, it was about negotiating an enterprise agreement. So what we see here is the mindset of the modern Labor Party, which is a Labor Party that is driven by the union movement. And the union movement were the biggest handbrake on, on the development and the signing and, and the ratification of any of the free trade agreements that the previous coalition government signed. And we signed free trade agreements with countries all over the world. Because guess what? Australia is an island. We're a trading nation. In Australia, we make enough food, we produce enough food, we manufacture enough food uh, to, to feed our population plus another 50 million people. We make enough food, we grow enough food in this country for 75 million people. So we need to make sure that food for those 50 million people doesn't sit in the warehouses, in the paddocks, that it gets off this country, whether it's through by a plane or a boat or a slingshot. I don't get how it gets out of Australia, but it gets overseas and it feeds the people overseas. Because we should also remember, when it comes to, to trade, and I, I, I don't want to raise it, but the Labor Party is the party who, when they were last in power, not only did they not sign a single trade agreement, free trade agreement, that they cut off a country's main supply of protein. That when, when, a, when a previous senator in this place was well, the agriculture minister, the Labor senator, Joe Ludwig, uh, you know, watched a program and had a bit of a bit of a something happened upstairs in, in his brain, and he cut off the protein supply to Indonesia, one of our most important neighbours, one of our most important trading neighbours, one of our most important neighbours for geopolitical reasons. And because of a, a TV program, the Labor Party cut off, cut off the protein supply to that country. And not only did they do that, they devastated the cattle industry in Queensland and the Northern Territory. So we won't take lessons from the Labor Party and, the, and their allies there in the Green Party who think food comes from you know, the fridge uh, and thinks it's made by a magical mystery Senator machine. Billy, point of order. Uh, the senator just seems to have completely lost the plot. He's just talking complete rubbish at the minute. Right, We've never said food just comes out well, of the fridge. A, unfortunately, it's maybe that's, uh, the, the member may be or may not be talking rubbish, but he is, uh, I've allowed a bit of latitude on all speakers on all sides, and he is vaguely irrelevant. What is interesting, Mr Acting Member President, is a member of the Labor Party has come to the defence of the Greens. So we've got the coalition here, this access of economic dunces. We've got the Greens who think the money, uh, who runs this economy, comes from a sort of a magical mystery money tree at the bottom of the garden. And then we've got the Labor Party who thinks money just comes from, I don't know, brown paper bags, if you listen to the New South, or New South Wales Labor Party. And that's how you govern the country. Well, welcome to the new paradigm that is Australia. It is the Labor Party running a protection 
protection racket for this mob because this mob over there, Mr. Acting Deputy President, or Mr. President, Deputy President, sorry, don't know where food comes from. They think it comes from the fridge. Well, guess what? It comes from the farmers and graziers of Australia. And what we saw in Question Time today was a failure of this government to stand up for the farmers and graziers of Australia, those who feed us those who will feed the Asia Pacific and those who will feed the world. And that's what we've got to do as Australia, is stand up for those who look after us. Because without farmers, without grazers, without all those people who are in the towns and villages, people like where I come from on the Darling Downs, without those people on the Darling Downs, Australia starves. We need a government who stands up for them instead of a government who just gives them, you know, goes Thank on you, to Senator the McGrath. Just... Senator McGrath. That was probably unparliamentary. Senator Billick, please bring some decorum. Oh, I'm, just, I'm just trying to take in that. Well, whatever, yeah, rant, thank you. That rant from the other side, based on some ideological view that, you know, they know everything and we know nothing. And, you know, I mean, so much rubbish I just heard. Complete waste of five minutes of my life, and let me tell you, every minute of my life is very important to me. Um, complete waste of five minutes of my life. As my colleague Senator O'Neill was saying, we've got a brilliant new minister in Senator Farrell, and we are, well, I am talking him up because I know that Senator Farrell understands agriculture. I know that he understands agriculture. I know that he knows what we're doing. I know that he knows his portfolio area. So he's, he's, I'm happy to build you up as much as I can, Senator Farrell. But the point is, the point is, as Senator Farrell said earlier, we'll continue to do exactly what we said we'll do in opposition. We will look after everybody in that supply chain of agriculture. We will do that. There's been 16 free, there's 16 free trade agreements in force, and the Australian government—that's us, that's us, you guys, it's us now, not you—recognises the importance of opening new trade opportunities for our agricultural industries, and we're working really hard with trading partners to do this. Senator Farrell said in his answer he'd met with um, the European ambassadors today. Great. That's so good. It's amazing that, you know, after two months we're off and running, we're in nine years, nearly ten years you guys were in government, you did bugger all. Bugger all. You did nothing. He had a meeting. It's called consultation. It's called negotiation. It's not just a meeting, Senator Scar. It's, it's what countries it's what leaders of countries and, and ministers of countries do to come to agreement. You might not understand that. We know your government had a different way of working. Your government was all about the photo ops, not about the delivery. It was all about announcements, not about any delivery. Your government, and to hear Senator McGrath carry on about something that happened when we were previously in government 10 years ago, when you guys jump up every question time and take points of order on the fact that we haven't done something in two months when you had that nine years, it's just laughable. The people out there listening will be just falling off their chairs listening to Senator McGrath's rant, knowing how ideological it was, understanding that we on this side are working for the betterment of all Australia. Some of the accusations that Senator McGrath made, quite frankly, I think were, were disorderly. I understand that the Deputy President did think he was, and I quote, vaguely relevant, yeah. and I'll take that point. Yeah, yeah. Point of order, um, in terms of personal reflection, I'm, I'm concerned that Senator Billick is going close to the line of reflecting on our Deputy President when she was uh, casting aspersions with respect to whether no, or not things Senator were disorderly. I think Senator Billing was trying to cast aspersions on uh, Senator McGrath. <laughs> but uh, I just ask you to restrain your, your language and raise the decorum of the chamber. <laughs> yeah, OK, let me lift you up. I'll lift you up. We know how to do the job. 
we will continue to do the job. Senator Farrell will represent us fantastically doing the job. I hope you're all feeling a bit more uplifted. I did note you were all very quiet in question time until it came to that question, actually. I wondered if you were sort of a bit fatigued, you know. And I'm not surprised you were mesmerised. What a great job Senator Farrell did today, stepping into the breach. This just shows you how good he'll be, he is and will be, continue to be as the minister. So, In 2021, 65.2 per cent of Australia's two-way trade was to Asian countries. In 2021, Australia's top three agricultural experts were wheat, beef, veal, beef and veal and, sh and sheep meat. Senator Farrell is quite competent, more than competent, at being able to understand how free trade agreements work, to be able to negotiate them to be able to come to agreements with other countries, not to scare countries off, not to stop other countries wanting to deal with us in whatever way, shape or form that we were dealing with them, not to have us embarrassed on the international stage. I don't think Senator Farrell will do any of that, but let me say your government certainly didn't mind doing that. Your government were happy to, in to embarrass Australia on the international Thank stage. You, uh, Senator Van. Thank you, Mr. Deputy President. Well, the coalition government has an excellent track record on developing trade relationships and promoting Australia's interests. One in five Australian jobs is trade related, which is why getting our trading relationships right is so important for the Australian economy. An economy, mind you, which is hurting now more than ever and the Labor Party do not seem to have the slightest idea of what to do about it. However, let's get back to trade, as that's what Take Note is about today. When the Coalition was in government, we implemented nine free trade agreements since 2013. I can list them to, for you, like uh, Senator Birmingham can, if I have time at the end. Lifting the share of trade covered by FTAs from 27 per cent under the previous Labor government to over 70 per cent now. That is what you call a commitment to promoting Australia's interests and supporting Australian jobs. What I question is Labor's commitment and ability to protect and promote our interests overseas. Now, let's just look at it. Prime Minister Albanese recently visited Indonesia and said he wanted to strengthen ties between our two nations. However, I don't know what he said in those meetings because it was only a couple of weeks later that President Wododo flew to China to meet with President Xi in Beijing. Clearly what the Prime Minister was offering was not good enough. Compare this to when the coalition, um, when the coalition was in government. In February 2020, we had the same President of Indonesia visit Australia and did address a joint sitting of parliament where he described Australia as Indonesia's, and I quote, Indonesia's closest friend. We are simply not seeing that sort of commitment or effective engagement, despite Senator Farrell's little powwow this morning, by the Labor Party to support and develop our international trade. Now, Mr Deputy President, we know Labor like to criticise the government over our handling of the French submarine contract as a rebuttal to that point of how we handle international relations. However, let's not forget that Labor are on the record in the Hansard stating that the French program was not keeping Australians safe. We heard over and over and over in estimates, in foreign affairs, defence and trade estimates, Labor senators criticised that program over and over. It was incessant, and I, I won't name all the senators that, from that side that were doing it. But it was incessant, and it was when, when we did do something about it, when we acted in the national interest, they still criticised us for that. Unfortunately for you lot over there, you can't have it each way. Now, Senator Wong, and shame she's not here, and Senator Esperts criticised the French submarine deal quite heavily herself. And I quote, she said, that's not keeping Australians safe. So we see Labor's criticism over the submarine deal was just a form of cheap political point scoring, which truly came at a cost to our national interests 
And that's what has impacted the EU free trade agreement. Nothing what we did on the, when we were in government. The coalition government acted and took the necessary steps to keep Australia safe. And out of that, the AUKUS agreement was born. Those in government now like to pretend that they would have handled it better. However, there is no truth to that, and it's on the record from Senate estimates. The reality of the situation is that we recognise the French were not delivering on the submarines, and when Senator Reynolds was Minister of Defence, she initiated monthly phone calls to try and get the program back on track. When the French could still not deliver, we did what was best for Australia and our national security and made arrangements to acquire capability that would protect Australians. Now, those opposite would not have been able to accomplish such a feat. And we still worry that they're going to screw up the AUKUS agreement. They're making horrible noises about defence and how they're going to change it. You know, a review from uh, you know, the previous defence minister has all the hallmarks of just shifting a, a, a few things around on, on the notice board. Let's see what they can actually do. But so far, it's clear to everyone that their record has been far from stellar so far. Thank you. I'll put the, I'll put the question. No, I just. No, we're not. We're, we are no. We are long. We've got a bit more of a journey. To, we've got a bit more of a journey to go. I'm going to put the question. Then, then Senator Shoebridge, I'll give you the call. I put the question to the motion moved by Senator Colbeck. Those for the question say aye. Against no. The ayes have it. Senator Shoebridge. Uh, I rise to take note of the response given by Senator Farrell to the question I asked regarding Julian Assange. You have the call. The Australian Greens will continue to call on Prime Minister Anthony Albanese to just pick up the phone, to pick up the phone, call the UK and US governments and work to obtain Julian Assange's freedom. The answers given today by Senator Farrell on behalf of the Prime Minister uh, lead to some very disturbing conclusions. The most disturbing conclusion is that it appears quiet diplomacy, at least so far as Senator Farrell's been briefed, Quiet diplomacy amounts to very little, if any, diplomacy, and our, the very troubling conclusion we have from the government's answers in the Senate today is that their intention is actually to so-called bring this matter to a close, but bring, it to a matter, bring the matter to a close by doing nothing to prevent the extradition of an Australian citizen, Julian Assange, do nothing to prevent his charging his prosecution and his conviction in a US court, and do nothing to prevent him being sentenced for up to 175 years in jail for the crime of telling the truth. Now, for the Australian government to do nothing when that's the fate of an Australian citizen today, and whether you like Julian Assange or not, let's be clear to every Australian citizen that today the Australian government abandons Julian Assange, but tomorrow it might be your son or your brother or your father or your daughter or your cousin or your friend. Once the Australian government sets the standard so low that they are willing to do nothing, nothing, when two of our closest allies between them are extraditing, persecuting, charging and potentially jailing for life, an Australian citizen who did nothing other than expose the war crimes of the United States government, what will they do next? Who will they betray next? Now, what is equally troubling is we've had a change of government here in Australia. We've gone from, notionally, from heavily conservative to notionally Labor. And in the United States, it's gone from Trumpian to the Biden administration, and the 18 charges that Julian Assange is facing were all laid under the former Trump presidency by the US Department of Justice. 18 charges brought by Donald Trump against an Australia, by John, Donald Trump's administration against an Australian citizen, trying to put him in jail for 175 years for an alleged crime that never happened on US soil. The US government has admitted never harmed a US citizen, and all it did all it did, but it was a powerful thing, 
was tell the truth about US war crimes and, and, and expose the evidence and the disclosures from former US intelligence analyst Chelsea Manning that detailed appalling war crimes and human rights abuses committed by the US government. Mm -hmm. Julian's crime, if you can call it that, is telling the rest of the world the ugly truth about the war. Now, the US seeks Julian's extradition from the UK, and in that process itself, Julian's rights have been abused. He's been held now for three years in maximum security in Belmarsh Prison, and if convicted, faces effectively a death sentence. Yet the speaking notes given to Senator Farrell here are that the Australian government is satisfied about Julian Assange's health and is satisfied that his health and welfare is being looked after in this system. How could you be satisfied? Three years, three years in maximum security, potentially another lifetime in maximum security, when all of the evidence shows that Julian has seriously deteriorated in health, evidence that was accepted by the UK courts, clearly accepted by the UK courts. And the evidence is that his rapidly deteriorating health is actually due to the prolonged arbitrary detention. It amounts simply to torture. And indeed, the UN Special Rapporteur on Torture, not, or the former UN Re Special Rapporteur on Torture, Niels Meltzer, has stated that Julian is a victim of ongoing psychological torture. That's not the Greens. It's not Julian's lawyers. It's the UN Special Rapporteur on Torture who said that. And UK magistrates and the High Court have accepted expert testimony. It's not challenged that if extradition were to become imminent, Julian would have an irresistible urge to take his own life. So I say to Julian, if you're listening here, the movement is growing to free you. You have more friends than ever in this parliament to free you. And it's about time that your government and your prime minister understood their obligation to Australian citizens. Thank you, Senator Shoebridge. I'll put the question. Those for the question say aye, hence no, the ayes have it.